We have Cheryl Crow. Let's hear it for Cheryl. Thank you. Hello. Uh, hello, hello, madam. Thank you for uh, thank you for joining us. It's been a while. It's been a couple of years, and uh, in in that time, you've been busy being a mum. Is that why you've been so invisible? That, and I haven't really wanted to work. Just uh, been laying low and doing things other than the music. And I think the last time we were over here was 2008, and we did the Hyde Park Calling thing. Mm. And did some radio, but yeah, we have a new record out, and so figured we might as well get back to work. Because this, this is something that uh, this intrigues me. You live on a massive ranch, and you've sold 35 million records. Why would you ever come out of that ranch? I would be behind those <laughs> gates permanently. What, what motivates you to come out? Well, it sounds kind of romantic, but it's not all that. It's, um, it, is, it is great because we kind of live, my kids are growing up in a total, like, uh, normal upbringing. But I love playing music. I mean, that's... That's my whole, it's not my whole life, but it's definitely a large part of my life. And I make records so I can go out and play and have a connection. And so I would really miss it if I didn't do it. Are you going to bring the kids on tour with you? Uh, no, I'm going to leave it home. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 yeah, definitely. They're, you know, they're, they are mine and they got to be with their mom and yeah. they're which, used to it. Which one's your favorite? Um, <laughs> it's funny you should say that. No, I don't know. <laughs> And, uh, and when they're at home on the ranch, have you got animals? To, yeah, we have 16 horses and two longhorn cows and a bunch of chickens and a couple of donkeys and wow. fish. Are they at the stage where they can milk the cows yet? Uh, we, they're not milking cows. They're, they're longhorn, they're like bulls. Oh. Yeah. We got, they're Ted and Steve. We call them Ted and Steve. Ted and they're Steve. They're like lawn ornaments. <laughs> we just go out and point at them and, aren't they cute? And of course, it, it, it saves on uh, lawn mowing. <laughs> I imagine. Yeah, well, sort of. Uh, you, you've been doing this, uh, this is your seventh album. Do you ever think as a songwriter, oh, I've got nothing to say, I've said it all, everything I ever wanted to say, I've no, now said nobody it. Nobody can be us like me. <laughs> I always have things to go on about. Yeah? No, actually, I really, I, I had one album that I found really difficult to complete just because I felt like I'd been working so long and that my whole life had been on the road and I didn't really have anything to say. But man, the last few years as an artist, I, there, it's just a, com a total compelling time to write. Mm. There's just so much to write about. Um, you know, that's, that's the thing. Sometimes you just got to sit quiet and see what comes to you. And is it better being an American now coming to Europe than it was? It's say, just two better or three being an American. Yeah. No, <laughs> <laughs> um, is it better being an American what? But coming to Europe than it was three or four years ago. I think a lot of Americans uh, were feigning Canadian accents back then. Oh, man. I spent a lot of time in Spain and um, in France back then uh, because I was going with a cyclist. And um, it was, you know, we were just going to war and watching um, the news over here was completely different than what it was like at home. Mm. You got a really fair depiction of what people felt about Americans in general. And, um, yeah, I'm glad that Obama's in office and we're at least attempting to resurrect our good name. Yeah. The, the, uh, the record, by the way, it sounds, it sounds very fun. It's got sort of a big Motowny sound to it. Are those, uh, are those the records in your collection? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, my favorite tunes, people ask me, what do you listen to on your iTouch? And I always go back to that old stuff. Yeah, you know, yeah. Playlist and playlist of great R&B and soul and blues. And, and was it a labor of love getting those sounds? Because, of course, back then they didn't have the, the boxes and gadgets that you have now, and they would use things like gravel and chains to get the percussion sounds. Did you, <laughs> did you try and emulate that in, in any way? Or? We used a couple of lawnmowers and a, a weed <laughs> whacker, and it worked out pretty well for us. Um, now, I worked with Doyle Bramhall Jr., who's sitting here with me, and... Um, and a guy named Josh Stanley, and they had just finished producing Eric Clapton. And if you haven't heard that record yet, but it's great. It's coming out, coming out pretty soon. And um, I wanted to work with these guys because they are, I mean, they're both so well-versed in this kind of music, um, not only stylistically, but sonically. And the attempt was, you know, not to mimic that, but to actually make a record that is uh, true to the, to the beauty of those records and yet have it be, you know, still an artist record. Mm. You're sitting yeah, am I correct, Doyle? Could you say that fairly? Yes. yes. He's like... <laughs> 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 you're, you're sitting behind a rather exciting piece of uh, instrumentation. You're, you, you're behind an old Wurlitzer, which I was... I do think that the Wurlitzer is a very exciting and sexy yeah. instrument. And this one has a bit of history, too. This one does. It has Billy, Billy Preston's zhuzh all over it. <laughs> his, his mojo, if you will. You didn't disinfect it first. <laughs> I, there, I, listen, Billy Preston, I, I, he is 
one of my favorite musicians that ever lived. Cheryl, on, on the new record, you've got a variety of uh, special guest stars appearing, including, Indeed. including Keith Richards. Yes. Uh, now, you, you've known Keith for a long time. You've performed with the Rolling Stones. I have. I've been years. very lucky. In fact, they were the first, um, really the first established artist to invite me to play when I first got started. So they've, they've been ultra kind at me. And can you remember the first time you ever were in the same room as Keith Richards? What was that like? Yeah, that was it. It was Thanksgiving Day in 1995, I think it was. And we were in Florida, and uh, they invited me to sing on a pay-per-view they were doing. And um, it's funny because I got a call in the middle of the night in Amsterdam from Mick Jagger. And it was 4.30 in the morning, and nobody had bothered to tell me that I, w I should be expecting a phone call from Mick, so I hung, hung up on him the first time, <laughs> thinking that it was one of the band members, whatever, out drinking, and, hey, <laughs> what, what's up, chick, you know, whatever. <laughs> and, um, and then he called back, and he said, this really is Mick Jagger. Before you hang up on me, this is Mick Jagger, and I wonder if you want to come play with us. So we talked about songs, and, um, and he said, well, think about it. Give it a think for a minute. And, and so I said, well, why don't we do something really rocking? And he goes, well, why don't we do Wild Horses? And I was like, great. He said, that's a nice song. I said, that's a nice song. That's indeed a nice song. And then when I got there, um, it was, I think it was actually Thanksgiving Day, they said, so you're going to play Live With Me. I was like, I'm going to do whatever y'all tell me to do. And um, so that was the first time I got to play with them. And it's, I mean, obviously, uh, if we any of us close our eyes and think of Keith Richards, we see this rock and roll pirate. Is there any time when he's not like that? Um... I have never seen him when he wasn't like that. I mean, he's pretty authentic. He, he literally, we we had a song that we wanted him to play on that was a, a reggae song, and his response to it was, "I'd love to come play. As soon as I get back from the islands, I'll drop in and play." <laughs> and that is just who he is. He's he's the real deal. He's falling the architect. Falling out of trees. Of <laughs> falling out of coconut trees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, he's um, the goods. And also on the record, there's a bonus track, there's a cover version of uh, the Jackson 5, I Want You Back, which mm -hmm. you dedicate to, uh, to Michael Jackson. I don't know how this escaped me, but I didn't know that you'd, you'd been a backing singer for Michael Jackson back in the day Where as well. Where have you been, Jeff? I don't know. Um, I, didn't, I didn't have Wikipedia the last time yeah. I was reading up on you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, um, I worked with him in 1988. He was the, really the first person to ever hire me. And so. was, he, was, was he somebody who was easy to be friends with? Was it... I wouldn't say we were friends. He was pretty reclusive back then. In fact, in fact I'm sure he was always reclusive. He was major, like the most major star. Mm. And um, I, I loved working with him, and I loved witnessing his divine brilliance every night. I mean, every night he stepped on stage, it was a reminder of why he was so, um, so important in the history of music. And I don't know that there'll ever be anybody like him again, but... Um, it was, it was amazing. I got to sing the duet with him, and I got to sing actually a couple duets, Man in the Mirror and I Just Can't Stop Loving You. And I learned a lot from him, and he was a very special person. And I Want You Back in, the, in that sort of era of Jackson 5, Jackson stuff. Yeah, it was the first record I ever owned. Santa Claus right? brought me ABC when I was seven years old. Where did you get it from? Santa. <laughs> <laughs> so that was your Christmas Day, seven years yeah, old? Yeah. Wow. What was the first record you bought yourself with your, with your own hands? Uh, it was a Grand Funk Railroad tune, and I, um, it was a 45. I yeah. hate cool people who haven't got embarrassing first records. Uh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm sure I had as well. I'm sure I had the Partridge family as well. <laughs> uh, I notice you've got, because uh, these songs are, are, are brand new the, um, from the album, you, you're still at a stage where you've got the lyrics in front of you. How difficult is it to memorize them when well, you're, when you're on tour? Well, I know them. It's just that, you know, it's funny when you're doing radio, if nobody's watching, I, I just as soon get the lyrics right. <laughs> 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 Knowing that they're going to get played over and over. And I have heard myself do some renditions on radio that are hysterical, <laughs> where the lyrics are just a mishmash of rhyming words that have nothing to do with the actual songs. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Now, you are performing um, Saturday at mm -hmm. 8 p.m. You're doing a charity all-star concert. Yes. How excited are you in your home state to be able to come back and do something like this? Oh, it's great. I mean, it's really a wonderful homecoming for us, and we haven't played here in a while. But not only have we not played here in a while, we haven't played on the Arch in years and years. And that's just huge for me because I have such um, great memories of being down here on 4th of July and also singing in the clubs down here, Mississippi Nights and Boomers. And I really cut my teeth down here in this area as far as singing and uh, rock and roll and pop music. And um, also I got to see Elton John underneath the Arch when I was probably 20 years old. So I, I have a special love for this area and I grew up in Missouri and I taught school here in St. Louis but also 
this is just such a wonderful event, being able to be a part of baseball, which I am such a huge fan of, particularly the Cardinals. Um, and also they've tied in with Stand Up to Cancer, which I'm also strongly affiliated with. So the whole thing is wonderful and special, and we're really happy to be here. Well, and you talk about this, the tie-in with Stand Up to Cancer. You yourself mm -hmm. are a cancer survivor. Yes. And this, this concert specifically is going to benefit Stand Up to Cancer. Yes, it is. And um, I, I have to say, I think it's... It's amazing that Major League Baseball has embraced this particular cause the way that it has because obviously everyone has been affected by cancer, whether it's firsthand or whether it's a friend or a family member. Um, but to shine this kind of light on Stand Up to Cancer where everyone tunes in to see um, the All-Star Game, it's, it's, it's really quite amazing. It really um, pulls everyone in and gives them an opportunity to be a part of something um, bigger than even baseball itself and um, to really help. I think that the number was uh, over $100 million in one year yeah. has been raised, which yeah. is so impressive. It is, and at a time when the economy is, mm -hmm. um, has been so taxed that um, so much of research funding has been cut, to have that kind of um, private funding go towards research with these big dream teams that they've created that are you know, research doctors and research scientists from across the world coming together and working together, sharing information the way that they are, and also um, uh, uh, special monies going out to special teams. And it's, um, it's, it's really important right now that this kind of funding continue. Now, I remember seeing you last year at the All-Star Game. You sang the an anthem. Yeah, yeah, I did. And you got to meet a lot of the players. Uh, yes. You got to go down. I think I saw you talking to Jeter and a couple of the other guys. How did yeah. that to get to just face Fantastic. to face? Fantastic. I mean, you know, in my household, they're the rock stars. You know, my, my nephews are 11 and 9, and they know every statistic on every baseball player. And uh, they're going to get to meet Pujols tomorrow. And they'll get to meet Derek Jeter, and uh, hopefully, and so many great players that they know. And also, it was really exciting to be in Yankee Stadium the last game. Yeah, you sang and it. And to sing the National Anthem with Hank Aaron standing, you know, from here to there um, was, I don't know if there's anything bigger than that. Now, growing up, do you have any specific memories of Old Bush Stadium and going there as a child and getting oh, to catch yeah, some games? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, we went there a lot, and... Um, when we were little kids, we ran around and ate, ate hot dogs and were totally obnoxious. But then, you know, later on, we got into the actual <laughs> sport. And so, um, and when I was in college, we had the I-70 World Series. So when I was in college, I really knew all the names. And I got to meet and hang out with Ozzy Smith and Willie McGee. And I lived right across the street from Wadi Herzog. So I was very, you know, deeply invested. I know you're looking forward to just playing under the arch and being able to do this. Anything else special about this to you? Yeah, you know, we're, we're really excited to get to have Elvis Costello come out yeah. and show us how, how it's really done. Are you guys so, singing together? or? Yeah, we're going to sing together. We're going to play some stuff together. And we're, we're, my, my band and I are huge fans of his. So um, we expect um, to have the bar raised on us. So it'll be fun. Nine time Grammy Award winning recording artist and Missouri native. Cheryl Crow. Good afternoon. I want to thank everyone for coming. And I want to say what a great honor and privilege it is for me to stand here in front of the arch. My, uh, some of my best memories are from the three years that I lived here. I taught in Rockwood School District. I um, was a music teacher way back when music was a part of the school system. And um, I want to say that I lived in Georgetown Apartments right across the street from Wadi Herzog during baseball season. Um, I am from a baseball-loving family. We grew up with the Cardinals being a part of our household experience. Names like Bob Gibson and Lou Brock and, of course, Orlando Cepeda, Kurt Flood, Roger Maris were always thrown around. Now, I have two young nephews, as Tim mentioned, who, if they don't get to meet Pujols, I can forget coming home for Christmas. And um, so it's, it's really an honor for me to get to be a part of this wonderful organization. When I was in college, the big series between Kansas City and St. Louis was happening, the I-70 series. And during that time, I got to hang out with Willie McGee and uh, Andy Van Slyke and the great Ozzie Smith. And um, I, I wanted to learn how to do a backflip, not because I wanted to be a cheerleader, but because I wanted to be Ozzie Smith. So um, it's, it's great for me to get to come back and, and play under the arch. And, to also be uh, aligned with a great organization, as Sue told you about, Stand Up to Cancer, who's doing such amazing work uh, across the world, bringing together great 
research scientists and great doctors to pull their research together and come up for ways of beating this um, insidious disease. And as you all know, um, the statistics are dire. One in seven women are diagnosed with breast cancer every year. And I did a lot of work with breast cancer causes before I was diagnosed, obviously not knowing that I had it and knew of that statistic. And when I would think about my standing in a group of, of my friends, it would never have occurred to me Miss Fitness, Miss Eat Right would be the one out of the seven that was diagnosed. And luckily for me, um, I was diagnosed very early and I am a walking poster child for uh, early detection as a form of, of cure until we can find a cure. So while it's a great honor for me to have a, a huge fan base of women, I also feel it a responsibility to align myself with great organizations like Stand Up to Cancer to get the word out that early detection and, and diligence about mammograms and uh, sub-examinations is, 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 is um, imperative. Um, I also want to just say something to Jeff from Pepsi. He and I have a long relationship that he doesn't even know about. Um, 20 years ago when, yes, I was a backup singer for Michael Jackson, Pepsi was our sponsor. So um, we, we are definitely aligned with the, with the best and the brightest up here. And I can't speak to you enough about how wonderful the MLB is um, in, in allowing us to be a part of announcing the festivities coming up and also aligning themselves with Stamp to Cancer. So I just want to encourage everyone to come out and be a part of this great experience and uh, come out to the arch where I got to see Elton John come out dressed up as a duck when I was 17, play under the arch, and I get to be a part of that wonderful tradition here in St. Louis. Wellness to me stems from uh, mind and then from mind into body. I think mind and body um, as one are um, the perfect picture of wellness because the body responds to what the mind tells it. I've always been um, very aware of what I put into my body even though I will eat the occasional potato chip or the bag of <laughs> potato chips. But um, I was always very fit so it just goes to show you that with something like um, like breast cancer you just we don't know enough about it even still to know how it is we can prevent it. We all just deal with what comes at us the way we know best and whether that's to hunker down and be quiet which is sort of my tact or whether it's to explode or uh, you know publicly the the way that I knew best was to handle it like I, I've handled everything else which is in the quiet of my own home and with the people that love me and the people that were there before and there during and thereafter and my challenge through the cancer diagnosis and through the treatment and through everything else that was going on publicly at that time with a very public breakup and uh, my life really going from big to absolutely nothing and with the challenge of facing my mortality was to learn to sit with the emotions that go along with that which are which were fear and sadness and grief and loneliness and anger and despair and disbelief and it doesn't negate the fact that when you're diagnosed with something um, like cancer that those ideas don't go through your mind that am I gonna wake up every day for the rest of my life thinking is my cancer back or has it spread is it somewhere else and I try to remind myself of what a joyful state feels like and I try to bring myself back to that at all times because I know that the body just functions at a higher level when um, it's stress-free and so that's my objective is to try to stay as centered and as, as uh, serene as possible um, on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. A lot of people I've spoken to have, who have been through the cancer diagnosis and cancer treatment um, attest to the fact that um, they had a distinct lesson that was um, designed for them and my lesson was learning how to put myself first and everything up to that point that I knew best about in my life and what worked best was for me to take care of everyone else besides myself. Just emotionally, I always took care of people, always made sure everybody was happy and happy with me. And I was the last person at the end of the day that I thought of. And when I was diagnosed, I basically um, was put in the position where the only person that could take care of me was me. And I think everything up until that moment prepared me for the ultimate challenge, which was that. And um, so it was, it was a, a big learning time for me and probably the most important moment of my life. When I was actually done with the process, I, I felt like I was really done and I was very awake and out of that came the record Detours, which is for me a record about being awake.
it definitely became um, one of the fixtures in my life that I acknowledged for a while on a daily basis. I don't think about it anymore, but I keep my tattoos, you know, um, around my left breast as a reminder of the experience. Cheryl, when you were starting out in uh, music, did you practice for more than two hours a day? Absolutely. I mean, if you really want to be good at something, right, you really... You have to give it more than just two hours. That's and you really I... have to be quiet and be respectful, not talk. But, mm -hmm. I mean, that's just me. Yeah, that, well, sure. That's most people that are serious about their work. And congratulations on, uh, on your baby. And Thank you. Dr. the son. You like him? We have, we, we have what we call the bottom sandwich. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the bottom sandwich. But when the diaper's off and you just, like, squeeze the cheeks and it's just like... <laughs> it's hard to resist. Oh. It's hard to it's resist amazing. cheeks of any kind, isn't it? I know, I know. Yeah. He's really cool, though. He's in, he's in backstage, and he's probably going, what? Mommy's on TV. Yeah, you should but stop doing that to him when he reaches about no. nine, I, I think, will is not. a good... I will not. I will not. It's a good age to quit and doing I'm that. I'm going to be one of those obnoxious... I mean, I'm going to be like... I'm going to be older when he's 15. Like, older than the other mommies. Oh, yeah. really? So he's probably going to be like, why, Mommy, why are you still stuffing yourself into those leather pants? Your mom's a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, he'll be, I'm sure he'll get uh, accustomed to it because you'll, you will take him on the road with you and he's all that He's going sort of um, in about a month and a half. We're going to do, we're going to tour in the United States. We're actually going to tour in Europe too, but, but the big tour is going to be here in July, August, and September. And so we have to retrofit a bus. Well, you have, would you, would have you like babies. me to teach the lad to dance? <laughs> <laughs> actually, he's trying. To walk, yeah. <laughs> but he'll want to put in like six hours. He's thinking of dancing again. <laughs> Is he starting to walk now? He's trying. Oh, that's just, cute. You know, my nanny and I, we just casually walk by him and I could dance before I could walk. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you don't need to practice more than two hours. How will you keep him entertained, though? On will you be on a um, bus, you guys? And I mean, I'm gonna teach him how to knit. Yeah, I know, really. Um, I don't. I mean, it, it's ridiculous. We all, my whole band, my crew, we're all just like. We're just entertaining him constantly. Oh, that's good. I Everybody's know. like a little family unit. I know, it's going to be a rude awakening when he realizes that not everybody's just interested in his every little, like, Cheerio into the mouth. Cheap at a Cheerio in his mouth! Uh, <laughs> but he's taking swimming lessons right now. Oh, and he that's is? a blast to watch. It's the cutest thing. Nice. Yeah. yeah. That, and is, can he swim? He can. It's weird. He's been going under since he was two weeks. Ooh, two weeks? Yeah. They, I guess, you know, when you start a baby really early and they, they tell you the technique is one, two, three, and you blow in their face and they take a breath and you take them under. And they're, they're I mean, they're used to it because they were born in water, obviously. They live nine months in water. And so now he's 10 months and this great swimming teacher, Jesse, hi, Jesse, um, has got him swimming towards her. She hangs onto him and she says, close your mouth. She puts him under. He comes out, takes a breath. And does it like 10 times all the way across the pool. And wow. he just is unaffected by it. He has no idea he's doing anything unusual. Meanwhile, I'm at the side of the pool. <laughs> you know, like videoing it. You get very emotional with everything? A little, yeah, yeah, you know. Wow, this will be your first tour with a baby. I know. The baby runs on biofuel, I know, so that will be good. <laughs> yes, yes. Actually, we could probably fuel the bus with the... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, with his waste, yes. <laughs> yeah, and not only is... Uh, well, now you, I know you're very concerned about the environment. You do all yes. work, uh, and this is... Your new CD is edible, yep. I understand. It is. Which it's is nice. It's quite tasty. It's it's called Detours, and you started with your, uh, you got back together with the guy who produced your very first yeah, album. Yeah, it was great. Actually, I, um, the last, I guess, four or five records I've produced, it's really, it's hard work. It's great, it's gratifying, and as an artist, it's fun to feel like you're still growing and getting, you know, better at, at each thing that you're doing. But on, on this record, I just wanted to be the artist and be able to just write and um, be creative. And so I called Bill Betrell, who produced my first record, and... It was fantastic. It was just really fun and a great homecoming. And we did 24 songs in 40 days. And it was just a great, great creative. Well, that's great. I wonder time. if that kid realizes how lucky he is. If he'll ever realize. I guess kids don't really think about that sort of thing. But oh, to get I'm you as so a mom. I'm so lucky, though. I mean, that he picked me, you know. Yeah. Beautiful. There you go. Cheryl Crow, everybody. Cheryl, it's lovely to see you again. I have to tell you, I'm obsessed with drunk at, with the thoughts of you. Oh, thank you. Do you know why? Because you've captured... Do you know when you're crazy for somebody? Do you remember that? Yeah. Do you remember that? Years ago. As the bombs are dropping in the Blitz. <laughs> there may have been an ARP ward and you had your eye on. You know what I mean? And you, you get... Uh, where it says about... I'm ha it's, you, it's spot on.
Thank You're you. so smart to do that. It's just, I've played a concert, it's gone on the iPod. Oh, yeah. that's all. Right, I made yeah. it! Yes, yes. Games the same, the seriously. That's yeah. what she said to me backstage. Yeah. 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 That song, actually, because I'm not involved with anybody right now, um, yeah. but... How is that possible? <laughs> I know, I know, I'm gone. I'm involved. <laughs> I'm involved with a one-year-old. I mean, Aww. he just turned one, so oh, he's he? my main man. Yeah. He's fantastic. I mean, he's just like a, ugh. Love yeah, but Love I know, yeah. yes. But that song is kind of like it's 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 that dream about ooh I can't wait till I feel that way again you know mm. I haven't met him yet but ooh I can't wait. So. Well I, I thought she's a witch when I read this because you've got you've got the feeling <laughs> it's perfect. Oh thank you. You know in the lyric that you know that sort of I can't wait and, and yeah. you know it's spot on it's just yeah. I love it. You've got a mad crush on somebody. Yeah yeah it's it's just you've got it right down there it's brilliant. Good. Thank Why you. did you call it detours? Um, well, in the last, uh, I guess the two years running up to making this record, or the, actually the year and a half, I went through a lot of my personal life, and um, I, the thing that I learned through all of that experience of having breast cancer and my relationship fall apart, a very public relationship, and um, is that sometimes, e even though you know the course that you're meant to be on, or that you think you're meant to be on, it's the detours that take you so far away that teach you about who you are and help you to remember who you are. Yeah. And then, you know, at the same time that was going on, um, our America was just going through such a state of flux, so, and yeah. still is. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I look at that and think that's a perfect example of a detour. We've, we've gotten so far away from what our country or what we, we believe ourselves to be that it's, it's on our way back is where we're going to meet ourselves. And yeah. so that, that's really what it's about. Yeah. And you recorded this at home. Have you got your own studio I at home? did. I recorded oh, it at my farm in fantastic. Nashville. It was great. You never had to leave. Never had to leave. Oh, I could just stroll down there in my... My gym jams and oh, fabulous. coffee and baby and yeah. Because I right. keep saying to her, can't we record this down at my farm? You know, <laughs> it'd be lovely. All sat in the kitchen. You know, you make the tea. I'll yeah. make the tea. You know, and we'll I'll have Joyce there picking apples and what have you. It'd be great. Ha, do you that. love that? Because you, you live on a farm. I don't do you? a real life farm with yeah. cows and. Uh, we're putting in solar panels and just um, planting a garden, trying to be completely yeah. self-sustaining, yeah. um, and chickens and the whole thing. Are you so growing really all fun. your own food as well? Are you growing all your own vegetables? I'm going to try this my first year, it's easy. so I don't mind pulling weeds, but I have the like the brownest thumb. Yeah. I mean, every plant I've ever been given has died within hours, so you know. Snap! <laughs> I, I'll go to the garden centre. I'll buy a plant. It'll be on the back seat of the car, and I'll turn around and you see it cutting its veins because <laughs> it knows where it's going. <laughs> That's what happens with me too. And me. Beautiful. I only have to look at them and they're going, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, there's a secret to growing all your own fruit and veg and all that. Get a couple of gardeners. I know, I know. I feel kind of guilty about that, but I probably will wind up doing that. Now, as, as becoming a mother, as, uh, is it what you expected? It is so much fun. I mean, I'm so blessed because my baby, at three months we started making the record, so he was there the whole time and um, was passed around, so he's very social, and which is great because we're on yeah. the road and the band and crew carry him around like a little prince. Yeah. But we flew here this morning, 10 hour flight, and he slept seven hours, and he's just great, just, just perfect, and so joyous, and just a blast. He's, on, he's, he's watching me right now, hi Wyatt, wherever you are, hi. So he's very, he's very, he'll look at the TV and see me and not understand right. that, why, why is she in there? He'll go to the TV and put his hands on. She's got out the back to have a look. <laughs> but I've turned into one of those moms that, that like, you know, the, the obnoxious woman who has the dog or whatever that's, you know, talks about the little things the dog does. I am that woman now. Oh, is that you? Yes. Well, I'm the same. I've turned, you know, Catherine Tate's nan. Yes. I've turned into that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving up, and it's like they become your life, don't they? Yes. You know, it's all... And every little thing is so fascinating. And... Every time they smile, you get the camera like, Look, oh, he's yeah. smiling. Look, he's smashing all my dishes. Look, <laughs> <laughs> he's got Buster by the tail. <laughs> but aren't they bless? Absolutely. Yeah, blessed. it's the most fun. And yeah. I, you know, it keeps you young. Yeah, and yeah. You... It's just great. Now, you've got a big gig coming up here in the UK, haven't you? I do. Yeah. Where Actually, are we? we are uh, playing at Hyde Park. Oh, I'm not sure. I think right. it's July 20. Yeah. I'm not sure what the date is, but um, and John Mayer's going on, and then we're going on, and then Eric Clapton's following us. So oh, that's I know. nice. That is a that's dream, fantastic. dream bill. Dylan was a is a big influence on you, isn't he, Bob Dylan? Yes, yeah. big. You yeah. know, he to me is the quintessential poet, really. Yeah. I mean, great American poet, yeah. and uh, and also a cultural icon. We we just don't have those anymore, where no. people actually write. Uh, about what's going on and how the collective feel and yeah. uh, it's really a, 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 I think a dead art form which yeah. hopefully people will start doing that because there's just 
it's a compelling time to be an artist. Yeah. There's so much to write about. And oh, tell them, me. Yeah. And I know another person you're mad at, Linda Ronstadt. Love. I'm me. Uh, I love her. Love I love her. her. I wanted to be her. There was a picture of her when I was young when she was in cutoffs. Um, I think in roller skates looking in a refrigerator. Yeah. And I just thought, oh my gosh, she's so. Just all woman, but an incredible voice. She sings oh. one of the best versions of Lush Life. You know the song yes, Lush Life? Yes, oh, she's yes. just great. She's wonderful, yeah, isn't she's she? she's amazing. You're looking fabulous. You really are. Thank you. And I'm glad you're well. I'm glad you're happy. I'm great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I had my two-year MRI and mammogram yesterday. And yeah, everything's okay. Good, so. Brilliant. Yeah. brilliant. Two brilliant. years is the mark, so. Brilliant. Just yeah. brilliant. Daryl, it's lovely to see you again. See you yeah, that. really. Thank you. Good luck with the single. Good luck with the album. Thank good luck you. with on the road. Thank good luck you. with everything. Well, in thank fact, you. exactly. You Let's hear it, please. Shut up, bro. Come on. An album that uh, my fans um, hold very dear. You know, that's it's. I, I got started before any of the big contests like American Idol. Before the 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 vehicle was created, and we really scrapped around for a couple of years and created a really loyal fan base and. Um, those fans are very dedicated to the early beginnings, and so we wanted to give them uh, something special. And there, there are songs on here that were from that period that didn't make the album. Um, and it is, you know, the other thing is that it, it is a look back, and it's, I think it's, it's probably a little more uh, weighted than even a greatest hits because it, it does symbolize something in my career, the beginning, I think, of, of a, a sound and. Um, also the impact for, for women in general. Mm. Now, it, it was something of a slow burner, wasn't it? It was, yeah. And, and it's interesting. I, I feel really grateful that I, I got to uh, get my start at a time when it wasn't just about putting a single out and having the single do well, or if the single didn't do well, of giving the artist one more shot before they were dropped. And uh, my record label, A&M, which was a small, uh, a, 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 a small label at the time and a very... Um, you know, a very well-respected label that had, uh, had a lot of history in, in artist development really gave me a long shot. You know, like I said, we started out playing for five people and eventually played for 200 people and eventually played for 2,000 people, and these were people that were dedicated um, fans because of the word-of-mouth aspect. So was it that? Uh, I mean, was it, uh, it? It sounds like there were two things that you're talking about. One is this, yeah, you were out there doing it the old-fashioned way, just mm -hmm. gigging constantly. Uh, and word of mouth, and, but but the other is A and M, you know. First single doesn't really do much. Second single, eh, you know, and then finally, yeah. all I want to do is the third single. They've given you three shots, three, yeah, and three that's shots at the brass ring there. Very not typical of today. And we we had already been out for, I guess we'd really been touring the album steady for maybe a year, a year and a half before all I want to do came out and won the Grammys, and then we toured yet again. So. Um, and I love that. You know, I love the story. I love the fact that probably I got in under the wire of the of the legacy and the history of being a troubadour, which doesn't necessarily exist like that anymore, you know, where you start out in a van and uh, you you celebrate the day you get an RV and right. <laughs> eventually you're in a bus. Well, uh, these days you start out in a van and you stay in the van. <laughs> Either that or you start out in a bus, and you know, or, an, or a private airplane. <laughs> is Is this... Looking back to a simpler time for you, is there a little kind of nostalgia f behind this reissue? Oh, I think what's going on now has nothing to do with what has ever gone on before. You know, I, I actually would say that the last couple of years have been probably a couple of my best years, um, necessary years, in, in order to sort of redefine what the rest of my life is going to look like. And um, the looking back on this CD, and it was actually a really fun process putting this together and to and getting to revisit some of this looking looking back does feel precious in that there was a real sense of innocence and a real sense of altruism about you know really working hard and uh, and the the idea of making it because your hard work was based in performing and honing your craft and all that sort of thing and I, I do look back on it and I think it was the beginning of a of a work ethic for me that still you know that I still adhere to that that idea that if I keep working at my craft that I'll I'll get better as a songwriter as a producer as an artist as a singer and um and that process doesn't stop and that really is the process that motivates me to keep going that idea that my best work is ahead of me um and and I I really love that that's the motivating factor for me is that the greatest song that I will ever write hasn't been written yet that's uh and and 
I guess, how do you measure that when you have all the Grammys and all the pl multi-platinum records, mm -hmm. you know? It, I don't know that you can really, that, those things don't ever, to me, they don't uh, correlate, they don't correlate to, to, to self-worth or to achieve, I guess in some ways to achievement they do, uh, it's, it's hard, it's hard to put value on those things because they're, they're an acknowledgement for me of, of dedication mm -hmm. more than anything else. And, and I, 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 those things for me don't go unappreciated, but I think in many ways they don't, they don't define how I feel about what I'm doing. Well, what you were doing back in 93 with, with the, this group of guys, Tuesday nights in a recording mm -hmm. studio in Pasadena, you know, it all seems, it, it seems so kind of Debauched. communal. All <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right? <It's> debauched. <laughs> so the line in the song where you're drinking beer at noon on a Tuesday, is that? It's possible that that's an accurate <laughs> depiction of what was going on at the time. No, I, I would say that the feeling, you know, the environment, the, uh, the, uh, the acoustic, the acoustics of this record are are really accurate to what was going on. Not just for me, but for a lot of people my age at that time, and how we felt about ourselves in this country, in the social, political, social, social climate of of that that moment. It's a it's a pretty fair depiction, I think, of 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 that time for all of us and for people my age. That that sort of apathetic feeling of we're not represented, we're not being heard, we're not being seen. Um, it's it's all captured. I think sonically on this record. So since no one's looking, let's go drink. Yes. Kind of, you know. I, you know, is that sort of that work hard, play hard ethic mm -hmm. and uh, the abject um, uh, depiction of uh, vast wealth juxtaposed um, with, you know, people who are struggling, and that that really was and still is somewhat, but definitely at the time was was a very real, real environment. The story goes that even after you had won the Grammys and the album had sold at this point something like two million copies, you were still tooling around in your old Corvair. Is that right? Yeah. You know, we had sold, I guess, really probably close to five million records before we saw any money. And it, it, became, it became a little bit of a joke, but it also became a, a hardship. My manager was still working in, a, um, in the closet across the hall from his apartment, you know, in his storage closet. That was his office, and I was still driving around in a Corvair and getting it fixed every couple of weeks. And, um, you know, we really had to take the label to task to get the money out of the so-called pipeline. And that, that is the age-old story of the, the way that the recording industry is set up. And I think karmically there is probably... Uh, is somewhat of a correlation to the way business has been run in the past and what's happening in the business itself now. Mm. So there might be a special circle of hell reserved for that, <laughs> uh, the people in that pipeline? Well, <laughs> I have to say, I, I, I have nothing but fond memories of being on a and As I said, it was a very, very respected boutique label. Um, but, you know, business was, was business, and business mm -hmm. still is business, and it, it is it is a... Um, it's a it's a difficult business to look at and and um, be able to justify how business is done. Well, uh, and and that's another question about this reissue is now you're, you're having to rehash and relive all the you know the guys who were in the band mm -hmm. you know complaining that you were getting all the glory and they mm -hmm. were being left behind and mm -hmm. stuff. Um, I think though, and I, I won't dwell too much on that, but I think the nature of people is the nature of people. You know, there everybody has their individual nature, and who you come in as is basically, for the most part, who you go out as. I'd love to say that people change and that um, that circumstances always bring out the best in people, but they don't. And um, I, I think that a lot of the grousing around was, was not fair, and a lot of people got very rich for doing a lot less than what Bill and I did, ultimately. Bill being Bill, uh, Bill Trout, the, yeah. the producer. Yeah, and continue to get rich. I mean, this album coming out... Um, <laughs> The, the publishing splits were split evenly across the board for people that weren't even that involved because they were my friends. Now, in, in a funny way, did this controversy also give you something to, I mean, you, you, you alluded before to, you know, uh, uh, women in, in the, the music world. Mm -hmm. I mean, did you have to work even harder to sort of prove yourself as not, you know, the girl in front of the real musicians who do all the work? You know, it's so funny. I never really, um, I never, I guess I never viewed myself as being the woman in the band. I was always, um, I was always an accomplished keyboard player and had been the keyboard player in many bands, in, including Toy Matinee with Kevin Gilbert. And um, 
was a musician first and foremost. So I consider myself to be one of the guys or, you know, one of the band. And so f I think more than anything, the experience of um, having suffered, um, the you know, having suffered the ill will of what were what were, were my friends at the moment of making this record became the impetus for the second record. It wasn't about proving myself. It was really about separating myself and protecting myself and um, allowing myself to do what it is that I already knew I could do mm -hmm. as an artist. So what did you learn from this whole thing? Um, well, you know, I think you learn about the nature of people. I think you learned, um, I think for me personally, I had to really um, toughen my skin, and, and that was not my nature. And still I struggle with that. You know, I'm a pretty open book. I... I trust people. I allow people in, and and um, I expect the best of people because I try to give my best, and it, it, that's not always the way life is. So that sounds like a hard lesson to learn right at the beginning of your career. Yeah, but I was 31 already, you know, and um, school of hard knocks for me happened fast at a later time, and um, I had a lot of catching up to do. You know, most people who are in my business start out when they're you know, well, now they start when they're 14. Right. When, I, when, I was, <laughs> when I was starting out, you know, 18, 19 was your average, your average rock star age. And so I, I played catch up pretty quick life. Those early days mm -hmm. on the tour bus, I mean, it, uh, you know, it, it seems like it went sour pretty quickly once the big money came in. But while you guys were literally kind of making it work, what was that, you know, how, what was that You mean like? the recording sessions? Well, the, um, Those early days touring around. Oh, the early days of yeah. touring. I, I, I don't remember it being sour, except for I will say, as I've gotten older, I've become a kinder, gentler person, for sure, to, to, court, to quote the first George Bush, um, in that I was so overworked. You know, back in the early, early days of promoting this record, we would, we would play a gig and drive all night long in a van sitting up, and then I would do, you know, six, eight hours of interviews, radio visits, and sound check and play and do the same thing all over again. And um, there was a period in there, unlike how it is today, that there was no saying no to anything because I was still trying to build the story. So much quicker now um, with the incredible vehicles you have with the Internet and TV and the opportunities there. But in, in the old days, you know, you in the old days. But, yeah, I mean, a lot well, has changed in... 16, 16 years, years in the music a industry lot has, yeah. has changed. Yeah. Um, that that being overworked and exhausted, and you know, fair amount of drinking and <laughs> um, being hungover, and it 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 was uh, it was definitely a more rugged period of my life than say, for instance, now as as I've become a meditator and yoga and all that stuff, clean living mm -hmm. adult. Boring. Boring. <laughs> uh, Ken from Brooklyn asks. Can Cheryl Crow go back and clear up the songwriting credit controversy concerning David Bearwald and Kevin Gilbert once and for all? I think he's got one of those names wrong there, but... Uh, Kevin Gilbert, yeah, is, okay. is correct in David Bearwald. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll tell you the way that it worked. Um, because I, you know, I was new to that game, Bill Betrell handled all the publishing splits. And also, these guys became friends of mine through Bill, and Bill just divided up the publishing between everybody. And, you know, whether you were the bass player and you were just playing your part, or whether you were the drummer and you were playing along, everybody got the same split. And um, So with this reissue, they're all still getting the same... It's all the same thing, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, with David, um, and I, I, you know, I say this carefully, um, David has through the years taken credit for many 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 things uh, not just on my album that he um, was much less a part of or maybe not even a part of so you just have to weigh who people are when they you know when they come in All right. um, the album is Tuesday Night Music Club it was the first we had heard of you Cheryl Crow mm -hmm. and the first line of the first song on the first record, talks about she was born in November 1963 on the day that Aldous Huxley died. Mm -hmm. Now, that was also the day that JFK died. Yeah. Why go for the distant second on, on the hit parade, yeah, so I to speak, that for that Yeah, I think that was really day? the point of it, is the fact that he was really... He was a little bit like Farrah Fawcett, you know? The day that she died was the day that Michael Jackson died, and... Um, 
although somewhat different. Aldous Huxley was a pretty important figure in that. Um, Author of Brave New World. Yes, yeah, in that lit in a literary fixture of that time, and I think he really just had like a blurb on the back pages of the paper, and um, and Kennedy took the took the big headlines. So you know, it, in some ways, it represents who that character is right off the bat. You know, she's somebody who feels as though she's not seen. And has always been, you know, that's somewhat um, my own story of feeling as I um, came into my own feeling like I was never seen, never appreciated, never, you know, th and that was really the feeling of the whole album. And, and our camaraderie, our, our group's camaraderie was based on that kindred feeling amongst all of us that we were misfits in a commercial world. What's I, that whole experience with cancer done for you? I think, I think it wasn't even just the cancer. I think it was everything that that happened at that moment. You know, there was a real peeling away of of everything that I had counted on, of everything that I had so the breakup my with, life was about to be about. The breakup with Lance Armstrong, which was throughout the tabloids. Yeah, and, and it was actually, it was really less about him and more about, you know, growing up and believing that life was supposed to look a certain way and that relationship was supposed to be um, a marriage and kids and fam, you know, and a, uh, everything sort of in order and... We, I think we sometimes do ourselves a disservice by f painting the picture and sticking to that picture. It, it somewhat limits possibility. And, um, you know, from, from that experience, I adopted my little boy, and I had to let go of what the picture looked like. And even the picture of my own health, that feeling of being always in control. Um, I mean, I was a fairly fit person and uh, took good care of myself, um, and then I got breast cancer. So, you know, there are some things that we just can't control, and... The idea that um, life is just a, a constant reminder that there, a constant remembering who we are when we come in, and trying to always get back to who it is that we are, what, who, who, where our truth is, and um, that's really what that experience was for me, and it continues to humble me and continues to remind me that um, emotion is the only way we'll ever really experience life and living, it, it, and that emotion is the gateway to awakening. So when you moved uh, eventually from L.A. to the, the farm mm -hmm. near Nashville, mm -hmm. was that a way of kind of creating a new picture of well, what that, your life could be? Well, you know, there, that's, got, that's got a couple of layers all, all of its own. Um, I had spent so much time in Austin and had built a real um, life there. Um, when that all fell apart and I was diagnosed with a life-threatening illness, the first thing I thought of was I, n I need to get back home. And home for me was the Midwest. Home for me was where my family was. And um, and home for me, too, is my music. And my music really comes from that part of the world. It comes from uh, God-fearing people who are very connected to the earth, it, not necessarily being where a lot of very rich people uh, well-known people live in California and although I have great friends there and I have a, a love f for my life there my real life exists where my essence is I think and that's and that's really the Midwest and and uh, it's not Kennett Missouri anymore but uh, you, yeah you still Kennett is tricky I love Kennett and that is my home but it's two hours from an, an airport so <laughs> <laughs> so you've got the farm uh, uh, and it, it's it's got you know horses and the the biodiesel tractor and uh, the organic solar panels and, and mm -hmm. we try to be you know that is also another for me a, a really important expression of how I feel about this planet, and that is trying to live as much of a self-sustaining existence as possible. And one of those horses is a Mustang that you've adopted. Yeah, his a name's wild Colorado, and he's of the Cloud Herd, and people can go on thecloudfoundation.org and learn about him and his his lineage. And I think that, that the Cloud Herd is probably the most visible um, uh, herd of, of wild horses um, and probably the herd that most people who don't even know about wild horses uh, that's the herd that most people are familiar with so uh, there are so many things going on and you you have lent your name and your music to numerous causes mm -hmm. why now the the wild horses what's happening well there's always been a struggle with what to do with these animals who are a direct link to our lineage to our legacy here in America these horses belong to the tribes, the Native American tribes who were here before we were, um, they were very connected to those people. Those those people 
um, honored their horses as members of their families. And um, it's our last link, really, to our um, our heritage. And in 1971, the Wild Horse and Burrow Act was put into place to preserve these animals' existence on the open range. And uh, I think it's like 93 million uh, acres have been preserved as um, American-owned, public-owned lands. And these horses have been given the right to exist on these plains. And where the Bureau of Land Management is concerned, and where a lot of these lands are rented to livestock owners, these animals become a nuisance. So the question has always been what to do with the animals. And um, so we're we're looking at a roundup that is scheduled to take place December 23rd, which is obviously in, in the mountain range is a very cold time of the year. And the animals have developed their winter coats. And these helicopters come in and they they run these, these animals 10, 15 miles in a very inhumane fashion. They sweat, their coats are wet, and they stand there in the freezing cold. And that's just one of the things that happens. And that's we're asking for a moratorium um, on the issue of what to do with wild horses until we feel that the advisory, the advisors to Secretary Zalazar is more fairly represented um, that the animals are fairly represented on on his list of advisors, because he's inherited adv- advisors who have been in place since uh, first Bush, right from and, the previous, uh, yeah. And really, under Obama, there's been probably more damage done to the wild horses than even when Bush was in office. And I think part of it is that there is well, no one's d- looking, right? Yeah, it, it is a point of of no one no one is looking. There are much bigger issues on the on the table. How are you doing? Great to see you. I have to tell you, I got the new CD yesterday. I listened to it top to bottom, twice over. Oh, my gosh. Uh, you must be feeling so good about yourself artistically, because I just feel like you're, you've upped your game. Oh, that's good. You know, it's funny, because um, I don't think I've ever in my career felt as compelled to write as I do now. And it's, it's a great time to be an artist, because there's so much to write about. And I think the tradition of writing about what's going on culturally and sociopolitically has kind of died, and it's fun to be... In my 40s and just kind of embrace it. And Let him fly it. a little bit. <laughs> exactly. Three years since uh, your last album. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, the big news that in the, in the uh, interim is that you have this uh, relationship with Lance Armstrong, yeah. to whom you're engaged yeah. now. Yeah. And I, you dedicate you dedicate the CD to him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, you know, rightfully so, because he um, kind of showed his true grit in the last year and a half while I was writing, just the fact that he could sit and listen to my songs and feel um, like he could be honest about what he thought, and he would ask questions, and I've never had that experience where I've played stuff for somebody I was involved with. I mean, it's kind of daunting, but, you know, it was really a nice kind of um, dialogue we had about songs and, you know. I was, saw you last in Paris, so the you know final day of the Tour yeah. de France, the seventh one. You were glowing and and celebratory. And uh, how how do you keep that straight? I mean, he's winning championships. You are recording records and touring and everything else. Does that does that work? Actually, that that year was actually both of those years were kind of a gift that I gave myself to just kind of step out of my career for a while and create the urge to want to write again and also just go out and collect stories so for me it was it was being on his mission and being a support for him but also it was very inspirational for me i mean just even watching that whole thing was inspiring i think for all people in the world so let me ask you a very personal question because right after the tour after the smiles Mm -hmm. there was this whole expose with the papers in france and all kinds of allegations he has been fighting this tooth and nail what what has that been like um, well, you know, it's interesting. I didn't see it rob him of the joy of what he's accomplished because I think he's ha- had this relationship with the French now since well before I knew him. And um, I think the way that it came about was so unfounded that it wasn't, it didn't even merit the attention that it got. Yeah. Um, I think after a while it just becomes like a gnat buzzing around your head. You know, you just get tired of it. And I've, I've said this from the beginning, he, he is a cancer survivor, which we all know, and the thought of him... You have your, your yellow... Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah okay, yeah. don't miss that. Yeah, yeah. All yeah. Right. But the thought of him putting anything into his body that could possibly hurt him is just not... It's not even... It's not even worth debating, so... Let's talk about the celebratory stuff. Uh-huh. So, have you set a date? Um, we haven't. I mean, the more we talk about having a wedding, the more we say, let's run off. 
<laughs> it's, you know, it's kind of like planning a tour. It's like, God, how are we going to get it done? And um, He proposed in a boat and you ran out of gas? He did, which is kind of funny. I mean, I, I laugh about it now because I, I think it sort of sums up our relationship in that we are we are the consummate team, teammates to each other. You know, I support him, he supports me, and the fact that we ran out of gas before we really officially start our life together and we pick up the oars and we roll back to shore. And to me, I think it's going to be the way our, our life is. It's a good metaphor. Yeah, it's a nice metaphor. I just want to have some fun. I mean, so many of us have been caught up with that song and have sung it all day, almost every oh, day. that's great. When you hear it on the radio, what does it do for you? I never hear the radio. I mean, honestly, I just so very rarely hear it. But I'm happy when I hear it. I, I actually heard it in a, a hair salon not too long ago and thought, wow, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> and then I went, am I getting paid for that? <laughs> but it was such a, a great song. So let's look at Cheryl Crow's background. Uh, you come from the Midwest, Midwest a, a musical family. Mm -hmm. When did you first know that music was going to be your lifelong passion, your business? I don't think there was any like particular instance where I thought, oh, I think this is what I'm going to do. I was raised around it my whole life. I was around musicians and music was always going on in my household. And my parents were uh, amateur musicians who played every weekend and would come home and jam with their friends, which kind of wound up being what, what I wound up doing. And um, we were, as children, encouraged strongly to take piano lessons. So it just wasn't anything I wasn't ever around. And um, it seemed to be sort of where I found my identity. And I, I just wound up doing it because it was the thing that I gravitated to and couldn't live without and uh, really enjoyed. I read some of your early musical uh, influences were mm. Bessie Smith, uh, Billie Holiday. Mm. I mean, the fairly sophisticated tastes for a young, well, young my girl. Mom, my mom is one of the most incredible singers ever. And um, she had a, a real deep appreciation for great singers. And there, was, uh, there were always people on the Magnavox, like, certainly like Billie Holiday and Judy Garland and Rosemary Clooney and people that were like the tried and true crooners. Uh, as well as men, I mean, there were a lot of a lot of men that were always on 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 the uh, Magnavox, and it's interesting. As I grew up, my parents were the people that turned me on to like R and B and uh, blues music uh, eventually, and they were, you know, they were kind of into all kinds of music as well as swing, which is what they were playing. I love Tony Bennett. Yes. What are your your thoughts on Tony as a musician? Well, he's uh, he just is one of the most amazing singers, and he still has it. And if you meet him. Um, I don't know if you've met him, but he just exudes this, this style and who he is. He sits down and he paints a picture and it's just in sync with, with, it, with his art. It's just, he's an amazing person, really. Mm. And to sit down and talk to him, he makes you feel like you've just known him forever and he's very comfortable and he's a great man. And wildly sexy. <laughs> we were laughing about it in the band. Um, we did Hey Hey at Saturday in this studio with Tony Bennett last time we were here, mm -hmm. which I know they don't do Hey Hey at Saturday here in Sydney mm -hmm. very often, so it was just kind of a coincidence. And then mm -hmm. when you said he was on today, that's our Australian connection. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I know Tony because we've got the satellite happening. He's uh, in New York at the moment, so he's listening to everything you say. Oh, I love so you, I love you, I love you. Send him a message. <laughs> well, that's... Oh, look, there oh, he is. <laughs> Well, Tony obviously is there, and I know you're such a fan, but yeah. I mean, your, your folks as amateur musicians, mm -hmm. what would they say to Tony Bennett? Actually, it's funny, um, my parents came out for the Grammys the first time around and um, had never been to L.A., and the night before the Grammys, we went to a Music Cares dinner, and Tony was performing, and he was gracious enough to come over and greet my parents. Oh, and, well, for my parents, that was much bigger than me winning the Grammys. It was all about, <laughs> all about Tony Bennett. So, so yeah. your Grammy award-winning night paled was into overshadowed by Tony Bennett's greeting. Yes. Oh. <laughs> they had their picture made with him. He was, he was very, very gracious to my mm. parents. So. You had overnight recognition, but you've been working on your career for a long time. Your road to success, so one of the, uh, the interesting milestones, I thought, was working with Michael Jackson on the road right. on the, the, the World Bad Tour, 1987. What was it like to work with Michael Jackson? Well, I had just moved to L.A. and I w was and am for a very small town, so I'd never traveled the world, and this was literally my first gig. Uh, once I landed in LA, about six months after I got there, I, I, I managed to 
to acquire this position. As backup singer for him and I had never been around the world and certainly he's not like working for um, just anyone. He's, Do you, you get know, to know him? Not at all. Mm -mm. Really? Which was interesting because I worked with him for 18 months and he, he was so uh, removed from the whole thing. He didn't really learn anyone's names and it was after after about six or seven months it really started to take its toll on everyone because in most musical situations you have the luxury of getting to know people and having that camaraderie and also you're giving your life and your time to the people that you're touring with and to not have any sort of relationship with them so it's he was so very removed. strange yeah and in fact you sang a song every show you sang a, a had three, with him. yeah three exchanges with him so this so. you're talking to a guy what was the longest personal conversation you ever had with him oh maybe five minutes <laughs> really yeah. in 18 months and that's i'm not i don't mean to slag him because he's very very professional and he's not He's, he's not like any other star we've ever known. He's been famous since he was five, very famous. So he's not going to be your average Joe uh, mm. in, in life or on stage or otherwise. And, uh, but that was my first introduction to touring and to uh, professionally, you know, on that scale, uh, performing. But singing on stage with him, doing those personal numbers must have, uh, must have been quite a great experience. It was a great experience. If you can imagine, the, boys in the band apparently had lots to say about it. The band, oh, the boys yeah. in the band. Well, I don't know. <laughs> you can't believe everything you read. That's for for certain. But um, no, it was. It was great. You know, I, mm. my first gig, I walked out in front of sixty-five thousand uh, Japanese people, and that's the way I sort of broke the ice. And it, mm. there were many great things about it. Literally, just many great things. Well, before we let you go, we must mm -hmm. talk about the new CD and one particular song, Redemption Day, which right. I believe you have great feelings for and you wrote it after a visit to Bosnia, mm. on which you were invited by the First Lady um, of America, Hillary right. Clinton. What was it like and how did that situation come up? Well, I was in uh, the studio actually starting to mix my record and I got a phone call from someone who worked in the White House saying, the First Lady's interested in having you come to Bosnia, would you be interested in doing this? And I was yes immediately I'll leave tomorrow mm -hmm. and two days later we went so I mean it was just that fast pretty much and um, it was a really for me a very eye-opening experience because we have it so easy in America we haven't had a war on our turf or even uh, around our borders well not since I've been alive in fact I missed Vietnam so to go over there and to fly through these war-torn areas was very very impactful. You know, you see a lot of it on, on CNN, but you become so desensitized to it that until you visit those places, it's hard to have any sort of emotional investment in it. How personally impressed were you by Hillary Clinton? Very. I, you know, if I, could, if I could actually have a platform to say what a neat lady she is, uh, you know, it would probably be helpful for some people to not have to believe what they see in the press because she's mm. not not the toughest nails ambitious woman although i think she probably is ambitious she's just very articulate and very smart but i think her motives for being there were true and she was very choked up a lot of the time as we all were and a very compassionate woman and uh chelsea was along also so to see the two of them interact as mother and daughter um considering what their lifestyle is was very um it was very inspiring to me i, I was very impressed with her Cheryl Crow is with us right now. Just play the song. This is getting intense. It is. They're trying to kill me. No. I've been saying this all day. Who's trying to kill you? My record label. Really? No. By, by bringing around all these shows? Oh my God. And this was yeah. the one you really wanted to do, so that it was It was. Actually, cool. the whole day has been geared around this show. So. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but tonight you go where? You open up for uh, a young and new guy. I open name? up for a beginning up-and-comer, um, Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan. Nice. I've heard, uh, I've heard, I've heard very good things about him. I have not uh, heard any of his stuff yet. He's but. so cool. Is he? Yeah, I met him. I actually met him three years ago. Um, I did a show, uh, the Bob, the Bob Dylan tribute, and he was um, very aloof. I mean, I was, I was just a background singer anyway. But, right. Um, but last night he came up to me and he said, "I watched you and." You know, you have something really special. If there's anything you need, need if you need any advice or whatever. Did he pull you aside and, like, grab you? He pulled you me aside. He, he was so nice. And I swear, the whole time I'm thinking. In fact, through my gig, I couldn't think about anything but, oh. <laughs> I just couldn't believe that Bob Dylan actually 
you know. Were you nervous when he first pulled you aside? He was going to say something else like, I wear women's underwear. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just something really like that he was just going to reveal something? No, or? no but he, he, he started off the conversation with, I read an article with you. And, um, and I thought, oh, God, I hope I haven't offended him. But I couldn't think of anything I'd said. Do you because watch you yourself know. now, now that things are, are really taking off? I do watch what I say because I have a very big mouth. Really? No, I don't know. I just, I trust people and then I open up to them and then I read something and I go, oh, man. Cheryl, trust me. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> How many times do you hear that from guys now that are on the road? Are people, is this a groupie situation now? You're on the road or guys um, waiting at the hotel with bonbons? And... Actually, ironically, with bonbons. Bonbons is all I could think of. Dog, doggy treats since exactly. I'm on the road. First way to my heart is when I'm through my dog. Your doggy? Uh, yeah. What kind of dog? Well, I'll, I'll show you. Oh, I'll show you. I'd like that very much. There he is. He's a gold lab. Isn't he sweet? Your dog has his own postcard. Look at this. <laughs> oh. I miss you, Scout. Where are you? I miss you. What he a beautiful actually, dog. Uh, he hopped a flight home a couple of days ago. Why is that? He had appointments? Or he, he had uh, casting, casting in L.A. Casting stuff? Um, he had to get back to L.A. Are you getting bored with the road? I mean, you've been on the road for how long now? Um, well, as I've said before, most of my childbearing years, probably. Oh, no. Um, since August of last year, really steadily. Do you want to settle down with someone short and hairy? Or... <laughs> no. Do you? <laughs> yes. Well, I have to. That's all I see in the mirror in the morning, unfortunately. No, I, um, I, I guess. I mean, someday. But you don't have to settle down, do you? No. I mean, do you have to, like... Settle down like a pretty much. Would you go out like, with a musician after after being involved? Do you want someone out of the? I've actually only ever dated musicians. Really? And I'm sort of trying to span out a little. I think you should. Yeah. TV, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> I hear all this about TV. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go for a talk show host now. Really? <laughs> Any height requirements or anything like that? <laughs> stand up. Please. No, we can't do that. You actually, you've, you've done a lot of the talk shows and things like that in the past year. I've done a few. What's going to, has this thing hit number one yet, or? Well, actually, um, I did a radio interview this morning, and the guy told me it was going number one next week. I said, how do you know that? But evidently it is, so. Cheryl, congratulations. <laughs>